Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Find more great shows like this at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle, and a very special episode. Uh, this is uh, Chris Spangle talking with Ryan Hold. We were going to do, we we're going to talk about Amash. Um, we we typically don't talk a lot of inside baseball for LP politics, but we figured we'd dip our toes in a little bit because there's some stuff that is happening on this coming Saturday. We're going to post this on Thursday. Uh, so that, that Ryan Hold especially thinks that everybody needs to kind of get involved in. There's some... All right, so Reinhold, it's hard to hold a convention with a couple thousand people in the middle of a pandemic. I think every municipality, every group, the Republicans, the Democrats, they're all going to face this challenge. Uh, the libertarian, you know, the, the way that a lot of libertarians are, they're like, don't be pussies, just show up. I, I, I mean, we here at We Are Libertarians have respected biology and tried to remain anti-state while being pro-biology. Um, you know, it, it, it's hard to say that you're going to hold a convention because it was slated for Memorial Day weekend in person in July, not knowing what municipalities or travel restrictions are going to do, not knowing where you could or could not hold it. I, I mean, online to me, seems like a good option. I know the Mises caucus is saying that's just a way for pragmatics to cheat. And I'm like, wasn't there like a four hour delay in some vote at some point because technology screwed up. And so they had to switch to paper ballots at the last convention in person. Isn't necessarily organized. I would think that there's more online infrastructure to handle an online convention because of online companies than there is to handle the in-person convention in July. So did I, did I summarize this well? Yeah. I mean, there, so the, the issues are that the, the convention was supposed to be Memorial day weekend. They realized that that wasn't going to work because there's too many States that have travel restrictions. So a lot of delegates couldn't make it. You're going to have an underrepresented delegation they're at the convention, and that's when really bad things happen. So they invoked in the impossibility clause, and they canceled that uh, or postponed that convention. And during the deliberations, instead of deciding that we would look at other alternative dates, other alternative locations, and possibly online, they threw the online part out because it's against the bylaws to do an online convention according to the interpretations of some people. Some other people say that there's an interpretation where it could be possible. So that gets into this whole argument, and we're libertarians, and is we love like to argue. So, is there an emergency clause? I mean, this is pretty unprecedented. Yeah, I mean, well, there's an impossibility clause, and and that's what they're trying to 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 go through. But then there's Robert's Rules of Order, and then there's the bylaws, and there's people who claim that they know the bylaws left and right and back and forth, and this is a violation, and this can't be done, and so there's just discussions and arguments about that. So, so a local municipality, do, do they have any idea when they'd move it to or where? They are, so they're, they were considering doing it sometime in early July, like July 4th weekend, something like that. The problem with that is, is that they're still, if you look at the, the uh, posted opening schedules for a lot of these um, states that have been posting them up and trying to do these things. Uh, that's still not early enough. You know, we There's still be too many travel restrictions and, and limitations if we try to do that. Right. So, and in you getting into July and August, we're supposed to have a, a, a nomination of a president and vice presidential candidate at that convention. How many months do you want to cut off on them being able to, uh, adequately campaign. Right? Yeah, the, and the longer that you you don't have a candidate, the more that everybody's going to feed on each other too. You know, so so there there was a huge blow up because the the LNC when they did this uh, discussion last Saturday, and they made the decision to postpone, and then they didn't make a decision on what they were going to do next. They made the decision that they were going to give themselves. 10 days to have a new date and time. And they were going to meet again this, this Saturday, which they're still planning on do this Saturday. And they were going to look at the proposals that were presented and they were going to make a decision. And it's like, okay, you've had two months to look at this and you think another 10 days is going to change anything. Well, 
it did kind of change a little bit because there was such an outcry and 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 hue and haw about this um, that a lot of people went to the LNC and and email blasts went out and there was a lot of discussion going on that they actually decided to compromise and try to come up with a solution. And that solution that is currently on the table, which hasn't been decided yet and won't be decided until Saturday, but the solution on the table is that they're going to hold an online vote for president and vice president sometime at the end of May and uh, still do that. And then they're going to do all of the other business, like voting on the new um LNC, voting on a new chair, voting on the, the judicial committee, bylaws, all that stuff is going to be in a uh, on-site physical um, convention somewhere in the future when it's feasible. So it could be September or December. You know, we don't know when it's going to be feasible to do yet. So there are people who are saying, uh, like you said, let's stop being pussies. Let's just all get together. And it's not our fault because some people are concerned about this virus that they're going to be too scared to show up. That's their problem. You know, we don't do this every year when people are worried about the flu or some other things that might you be think happening. We'd all be united against <laughs> government regulations preventing us from having our convention, but that's not the case. We're all united against each other again yeah. over the constant uh, schism and arguments between libertarians. And we, we yeah. infight so much that we don't need the other parties fighting us anymore. We got an uphill battle as it is trying to get, some movement against the, the Republican, the entrenched two parties, right? So uh, we, we have so much work to do there that we spend all of our energy uh, preventing ourselves from getting anywhere. And yeah. it's kind of frustrating. What's always frustrated me is that we should have had on-site balloting, electronic balloting for years. Look at the last convention that we were at. I don't know how much time you were in the actual room during voting Zero. was going on. Not at all. Never consented. There, we would take, we, yeah, we would take a vote. And it would be three hours for them to go through and collect all the paper ballots and then make sure that the numbers are right. And there was always a problem and somebody had to recount them. And it was like, we could have done this electronically and moved on to other business. And we ended up having to close out the convention, modifying the rules that we had for, for uh, electing the LNC because there wasn't enough time. People were just like, because you're supposed to have at least 50% support. Uh, of the votes in order to be on the LNC. And if you don't have it the first round, then those, you know, the people who do go in and then the others don't, they go to a next ballot and they vote again. So there are people who are on the LNC who didn't get 50% of the vote um, because we modified the rules because we didn't have the time. And we just said, let's just do this and let's get them in. And then the judicial committee <laughs> was even worse. It was just a bigger farce that to the point where a lot of people say we don't have a judicial committee right now. It was all because we, took so long in getting all these other votes done, the Ellen's, the, uh, the chair vote and all that stuff took too much time. And it's like, why not do? So I was making a big push electronic voting for this next one. And it's like, well, you have to go to the convention in order to get the electronic voting. So we'd have to vote for it this year. And then next in 2022, maybe we could do that. Right. And now this has happened. And it's like, so nine 11 happened. And, um, I remember the House and the, and the Senate were both like, well, what are we going to do if we need to conduct business, but we can't get to the Senate because there's a problem? We need some way to electronically do this. So they started trying to put the plans together to make that happen. And then the scare went off a little bit and they quit focusing on it and it never happened. And now this is hit and they're in that boat where they're like, uh, we didn't finalize any of the stuff. We don't have anything in place. We have to make it up on the fly. Well, our party did the same thing. Right. We we've for years just not done anything about this issue. That's been a glaring issue. A lot of people are trying to bring bring up, uh, but you've got people who don't trust the electronic stuff. And it's like, you know, they want it all to be at on site. And I don't know why that's so important to some people. And, and I'm but I'm giving it to them. If they think that's important, it's fine. But there's realities that are happening that we need to deal with. And we can't just stick our heads in the sand and just pretend that everything's going to be OK if we just go ahead and continue having the convention anyway. Yeah, it it doesn't make sense to me to disenfranchise a certain portion of the delegates because there's only a small number of delegates. It's only like a thousand fifty seven or some, you know, it's like around a thousand people. Right. And and with electronic, if you if you have a, an electronic um, online convention, more good people 
who are really strong in the party and who do a lot of great work and who really should be the people who are represented at the, at the convention, but they can't go because they don't have the money. They have family commitments that they can't just go away that long. They have work commitments that they can't take the time off. Um, this would, would solve that problem, right? Having an online convention would solve all of that. And we would have good representation from every state would be able to do this. And it, it's just, it's just some, People are like, well, we can't do it because look at what happened with an LNC meeting with 12, 24 people and Zoom. It was a mess. Like, right. You wouldn't use Zoom. There, People have been doing online stuff like this for years. Uh, shareholder convention uh, meetings where they do votes and they have to have discussions and debates and things like that. That stuff exists and has existed for a long time. And the only reason it's not more prevalent is because of the government and the, and the uh, SEC is telling them that they have rules in order they have to meet in order to be able to do that sort of thing because of the the, the voting and the, and the potential for fraud for that. So we're almost just supporting the government's dictates that this isn't something we should do yet by not embracing it. And it, that's another funny thing of it. But the the bigger part of this is now that this this is leaked that we're looking at doing the presidential nomination online. Uh, and then doing the rest of it later is that the state of California has now issued an edict that they will not place whoever is selected in an online convention on their ballots because we yeah, can't that, that get works. together and do anything. We have to have the conflict that works so well for Oregon. Let's form two. Oh yeah, yeah. Just dis the LNC can just disaffiliate the state party. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it's just, it's so yeah. frustrating because I know the people who are doing that out there, and it's like. Just put all that stuff aside. I know the ideas behind it, and they want to make sure a specific candidate gets selected, and it's all politics. Stop it. We are trying to do something here. We all need to come together and make the best of the situation we're in. And, and you know, leadership isn't mindlessly going by whatever the rules are, right? So no, let's, there are times to break the rules. Let's be honest about what's happening. If you do an in-person convention, you get 200 people showing up uh, that mm -hmm. can vote. All right. You have a set a number of people. The states pick the delegates. You go to your state convention. You get picked as a delegate. Then you go to the convention. Alternate. And then the LNC at their convention credentials the delegates. They decide ultimately who's the delegate because of credentials. But it's based on state rules. And so you have a limited number of people who can actually participate. It, it isn't some great democratic thing that if you have it online, then 15 million people are going to join and, oh, no, the pragmatists and the new Amash supporters are all going to flood. The, it doesn't work like that. What is happening is that people, and let's be specific, it's probably Hornberger people, isn't it? It's the Mises people. that are. I couldn't say yes. Yeah, let's <laughs> call it what it is. People who who know that who don't feel that it is fair that they have to compete with Justin Amash now. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, this is politics. You, you know, if you didn't, he was planning on running for a year. We all knew he was going to run it. So our, our rules are that if you, you could be at convention and they could just say, well, we want you to run, you know, cause they, yeah. none of the above on everybody else. Nobody on that list can be it anymore. They got to pick somebody else at yeah. convention. And, so and, why are you upset about somebody coming in a couple months, you know, before? And so the Mises caucus, who is full of a lot of younger people, want to disenfranchise a lot of the older volunteers of the party. People like Joe Houtman, who has been there since the founding, who almost won vice chair, who everybody loves. He's the official boomer of the We Are Libertarians podcast. You know, I don't know Joe's health situation, but like Joe is in the vulnerable category. I don't know that he's going to go to the convention. Mark Rutherford. But, but he's going to yeah. participate in an online convention. Yeah. They want to disenfranchise people who have been in the party for a very long time. And it's very unfair because they, they want to go and get their guy elected. You know, their guys don't care about the virus because a lot of them are into that camp that don't think right? it's so real. they're going to go and, and, you know, not be the pussies. Right. And then when they don't get their way, they'll just tantrum like, Hornberger did the last time and say that the LNC stole it from Jacob Hornberger, who you know, I, I so let's talk about Amash. Harry Brown, yeah, Harry Brown. In, in, Amash 
is being painted as by that crowd as somebody who is unprincipled and he's not a real libertarian. And, and I'm sitting here going, the guy was literally the heir to the Ron Paul revolution as basically crowned by Ron Paul. He basically crowned Massey Amash and Rand as his heirs. And so now the very people who would be supporters of Ron Paul, if he were running are backing Hornberger and tearing down a mosh, which makes no sense, using and an old-time party activist who are radicals from the beginning are trying to use the lines that were used against Barr and Weld, and we don't need a, another Republican. Okay, I get that, and that's a fair statement, but Justin Amash is not Bob Barr. Justin Amash is a philosophical libertarian and has been from the very beginning, and he, he took some votes that he's going to have to explain and clean up, but the reality is he's not Bob Barr who authored the Defense of Marriage Act. He's not Gary Johnson who is, let's face it, was a libertarian but weak on messaging. Amash is not that guy. So if you're going to try and paint him as Bob Barr or Bill Weld, you're going to look foolish in the process because the guy is a legitimate libertarian. And then if you, you, you're you going to go in in the fall with your guy and say, put put principle over party. Don't vote for the old two parties. Vote for our guy. When you didn't vote for principle over party earlier, like, you know, oh, well, these people have been working hard to go to conventions. Effort is overvalued in the libertarian movement. Just because somebody spent the money to fly to state conventions to talk to 13 libertarians in South Dakota, it doesn't mean they should be our nominee. It doesn't make them the best prepared person. If this field had been more prepared, there wouldn't have been so many late entries into this race, of which Jacob Hornberger was frankly one of them. Of Judge Gray was one of them, and Larry Sharp, and now Amash. If that field before... Chaffee, had, yeah. Who? Chaffee? Chaffee, yeah. Chaffee, yeah. And so, well, Amash hasn't done enough for the Libertarian Party. Jacob Hornberger, I'm a subscriber to his magazine. I've read him for a long time. He has not ever really been pro LP. And I couldn't figure it out because a lot of these campaign for liberty types, friends of Ron Paul, Republican libertarians were always negative against the LP. And it is sort of hilarious to see their champion, Justin Amash, wave the white flag on we're going to change it from the inside 10 years after we all told you so and come crawl into the Libertarian Party to join us. And all those people that I won't name names who gave me shit when I was the Libertarian Party guy going, hey, can you come help us with Gary Johnson? And you all said, no, I'm going to change it from the inside. I can't get involved. Now you're all coming to vote for Justin Amash. And let me tell you the effect. Justin Amash is not going... I have talked to several people over the last few days. If you think Justin Amash has this sewn up, you're foolish. There's a lot of old-time delegates, including pragma pragmatics, who want to punish Amash for playing footsie. And they want to punish that old Campaign for Liberty crowd for all the shit that they've talked for the last 10 years. And so what does everybody do? They vote no on the first ballot, or they... Vote for Vermin Supreme, because how could anybody elect the guy who has the boot on his head? And then you end up with Vermin Supreme winning on the first round because everybody was fooling around and wanted to punish Amash for bullshit reasons. So don't fuck around at this, because if you want Justin Amash, then vote for him on the first round. Don't sit there and play footsie. With, Find another way to punish him. <laughs> right. Hold him accountable in other ways. Yes. But... You know, Hornberger has talked a lot of shit about the Libertarian Party over the years and now finds it politically expedient to come and join us. Why? I didn't know this about Hornberger because I have always had a lot of respect for him. I think that he's been a huge source of prep material for us here. Uh, I've always watched his stuff. I've always found him to be too negative. I think he's a little bit too much. I told you so. And you should have listened to us. And he doesn't have like an inspiring message in any way. It's just sort of like negative. But I mean, the guy is principled and runs a great foundation and, and, and website. And, you know, I, I have respect for him. Um, but I didn't know his history with Harry, Harry Brown. Can you explain that? Um, well, I mean, so in 96, they were running against each other and Harry Brown won. He lost and everything seemed fine. And then Harry in 2000 was going back to him and saying, hey, can you help me out? And support me for 2000 and then i guess hornberger decided claiming that um 
he had colluded with the LNC, uh, and there's some accusations there. Now, Thomas Knapp, who uh, I know you know probably a little bit, he yeah, uh, I love, disagrees, I love with, his he disagrees with my history on this because he thinks that the history was different. But um, I know that the accusation was made by Harry Brown uh, that Hornberger was basically trying to invent this collusion that didn't happen in order to say that he was cheated out of the nomination. He literally said Harry Brown was quoted as saying, it's obvious that Mr. Hornberger isn't interested in the truth. He just wants to destroy publicly the people he thinks stand in the way of his leading the libertarian party. His entire strategy within the LP appears to be to destroy anyone who might oppose his nomination. That sounds eerily familiar considering Jacob Hornberger just did seven videos on why Justin Amash is not a real libertarian. Eight now, actually. Oh, really? and invented a bunch of the arguments too. Like, oh, he's for UBI. Justin is Ma not Mosh is not for UBI. I don't care. Daniel on... Berman will say this to you, and Hornberger will say this to you, and it's just not the case. He literally said on CNN on Tapper this weekend, he goes, You cannot have UBI and a giant welfare state. It's just not possible. He said, you know, as president, it's not something I would push, but if it came before me, then I would have to consider it as president. You know, and so he's not. It, 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 you have to be it goes back to the episode that we did yesterday you have to be really careful when you start resharing this stuff because you have to realize there are people who will just make shit up or share bad information because they want to they want to gain something out of it and and i have to be honest my respect for jacob hornberger has really taken a huge dip in the last week because he's willing to tear other people down to get what he wants and i just don't feel that that is leadership i don't feel that that is a good quality and somebody that ought to lead the party and you know if his history repeats itself and he blames the lnc for his own self owns i don't, i don't know how i stay a subscriber of, of his magazine because character really does matter to me right and you've got the so you've got daniel berman you've got him and you've got um well letter i don't even know if he's still in the race or not yeah, or no, that's not a, no he's not, not a, worth really discussing but he's that kind but then you got uh, Vermin Supreme. I haven't heard one word from Vermin Supreme about anything negative against Justin Amash because he's not talking about that. He's talking about yeah. him and making the point that he should be the nominee, not that he should be the nominee over everybody else or doing the 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 you know the lesser evil type of thing or or whatever. It's just like stop trying to win by tearing down other libertarians. Win by being better or being more inspiring or being somebody that people want to vote for. We need more people doing that. And I would, to be honest with you, I'd rather see if it was down to Hornberger and uh, Berman and, um, and Vermin Supreme and Amash wasn't in the picture. Vermin Supreme would win in a heartbeat for me yeah. just because he's, he's not those guys, right? Uh, who are I just so negative and willing to tear people down in order to achieve some sort of political gain, which is what we're supposed to be against. Yeah, exactly right. And, you know, I wasn't in on the joke until I co-hosted Christy and, and Jess Mears show right. and got to spend an hour, hour and a half talking with Spike Cohen and Vermin Supreme. And I was impressed by them both. And I think that, yeah, the boot on the head thing, it, it's all part of a satirical act. We Are Libertarians' tagline from 2012 on has been all of the irreverence modern politics deserves, and Vermin fits into that. I, you know I love Andy Kaufman and Borat, and so Vermin's kind of in there. So I'm in on the joke. I get it. I just think, you know, if you go and look at the comment that where I kind of say in Facebook on Facebook what I said about, you know, Amash may not win on a first ballot, there's a lot of people in there going – not vermin, not vermin, not vermin, because it's a messaging thing. They don't get the joke, you know. And then Spike Cohen, who is his VP candidate, comments a couple times, super respectful, doesn't tear Amash down, gives why they're the better person to reach out to Republicans and independents than Amash, and makes the case in a way that is super respectful. It's possible to do. And Spike Cohen and Vermin Supreme should be commended and rewarded for that. I'm sure they're not happy that Amash is in the race. I'm sure of it. You know, I'm sure they feel that it is not fair. I'm sure that they feel that they've worked a lot harder to gain delegates than he has. And he's going to come in with his CNN appearances and, 
and quote unquote steal. I'm sure that it's natural to feel that way. And I would not begrudge those guys for that. But you don't have how, how does a, a grown ass man deal with their anger and emotions? How does an adult but temper tantrum, don't they? How does an how do adult <laughs> handle things that aren't fair? Do they try to reason their way through it and treat other people with respect like the Vermin Supreme campaign is doing? Or do they throw a tantrum and try to steal the votes of longtime delegates who are more likely to vote for Amash by trying to do an in-person convention, which is nearly impossible in the middle of a pandemic based on state and local travel restrictions, meeting restrictions? It's just not possible. But you're going to try and, and start this bullshit to, to cheat. And then you're going to turn around and gaslight all the rest of us and say that we're the ones cheating. You Amash supporters cheated. You just go, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not going to support Trump. If the Mises caucus wants to behave that way, and I've tried to give them the benefit of the doubt, and the very beginning I was super excited because the Mises crowd were the Ron Paul people who were in that campaign for Liberty crowd, along with Amash, who were trashing the Libertarian Party, saying it's a waste of time, and then all of a sudden they want to get involved. And I was one of the people saying, I'm excited you're here. I'm philosophically closer with you than anybody else. And Michael Heiss and the Mises Caucus has just misbehaved at every single turn, acted unprofessionally. I have no idea why Michael Heiss has me blocked. There's no reason for him. I've had him on the show. Like, he and I have had multiple conversations. And you just go, like, how many times... You're endorsing Joshua Smith, whose ex-girlfriend has has accused him of domestic violence, and everybody knows it because they were together at the last convention and very public about it, and then they weren't. And you have the audacity to make your campaign slogan break the cycle, and you have told, told everyone, no, she's the one that abused me. And so she got mad and started releasing the screenshots. I'm the boss. What kind of man looks at a, a, at a woman who's breaking up with him and says, you're not breaking up with me, I'm the boss? Like, that's the kind of character that the Mises Caucus is going to bring to the Libertarian Party. It has nothing to do with your radical ideology or your Misesian values. It has nothing to do with Austrian economics or ideology. You know, Karen Ann Harlow saying it's the anarchists are not going anywhere. You're going to have to get used to it. Nobody has a problem with anarchists. Everybody has a problem with the way these people behave and the way that they treat other people. And nobody wants the Trumpian politics in the Libertarian Party. And when everything we don't want that, you go, you're not ideological. You're not a real libertarian. And you just go, if being a real libertarian is just being an immature asshole then no, I'm not a real libertarian. We here at We Are Libertarians for eight years have shown that agorists, voluntarists, constitutionalists, minarchists, uh, whatever the hell Ryan Lindsay is, uh, mutualists can all coexist. People who are, are Republicans and Democrats kind of trying to become a libertarian, that's been our entire history. And it's based on mutual respect and cooperation and a harmonious dialogue and you know, through we create content, even though we have ideological differences, it's possible. You just have to grow up. And, and, you know, I told you I wasn't going to rant about this, but you got me going. And I, I just, I don't get it. I don't get how, how I can like what I read from piece, people like Rothbard or Von Mises or listen to the Tom Wood show and like the ideology so much and then see the people that push it and like them so little, <laughs> you know, and it's, and it has nothing to do with the ideology or being impure it has everything to do with the way that you treat people and just keep it up because people are sick of it and you're going to lose all support. And people like Josh Smith are going to get 10% of the vote and it's not going to be anybody's fault, but Josh Smith, because he gets, he, he has issues and then he gets on social media and he has no impulse control, no self-control, and he just abuses people online. And so when people make accusations, take any criticism at all. Yeah. And so when people make accusations, you go, yeah, that makes sense. You know, and who wants that in leadership? Who wants to be under the thumb of somebody who acts like a little petty tyrant? We're trying to fight that mentality. You can't petty your tyrant, petty tyrant your way out of petty tyrants. 
Like, I, I don't get it. I just don't get it at all. And I don't get this move. You're willing to put people in danger basically to, uh, to help your guy win. And it's not fair. It's not right. And it's not honorable. And it's very unlibertarian to try and, you know, rig the system and then claim they're trying to rig the system. It's bullshit. And I, and I called them out on social media. We are libertarians called the Mises caucus out uh, because Nick Sarwark had a great response to uh, something uh, to them, basically somebody from their caucus. And, you know, I, I, I will tell you what it said once I pull this up. Um, so this uh, Adam Kokesh supporter writes, the following LNC members voted against principle and courage and voted to not hold an in-person convention uh, and then lists everybody. And Sarwark responds, placing the physical and economic well-being of members above a strict reading of the bylaws in an emergency is a principle. Placing the success of the LP's presidential nominee in their placement on 50 state ballots above a strict reading of the bylaws in an emergency is a principle. Having the courage to recognize that holding an in-person mass meeting during an infectious pandemic is irresponsible, even in those few places it is not illegal, is a principle. Working to allow the delegates who plan to choose their candidates a national committee had all of their voices heard on the weekend. They already, they already scheduled. Even if an emergency makes a physical meeting impossible is a principle. You may not approve of my principles. You may have others but it is false to accuse me of not having them or standing for them. And I'm glad that he said it. And so we, we asked, you know, Hey, Mises caucus, what's this about? And they didn't really, they, they, for their credit, we had a respectful discussion on Twitter about it and they just didn't have a good answer. And it looks like, uh, you know, do you think more voices would be heard at a rescheduled convention or in an online convention with over a thousand people involved? We want everyone to participate. And that's specifically why we oppose the online convention. And I said, well, basic economics say that if people are concerned with their safety and it's cheaper, more people will participate online. He, th this person said, yes, we could stream the convention and get a lot of eyes, but it's physically impossible to have the same number of voices in an online convention. Uh, I don't care how many people you get to watch. And I basically pointed out that, no, we're talking about the same thousand people's votes. If you think a party has the online infrastructure to handle all day communication between a thousand people with no problems, I don't know what to tell you. And I said, as opposed to in-person voting where it took several hours in 2018, and I'm sure there's online voting systems considering there's probably more of that than anything else. You know, so they don't really have an argument. They just have tantrums. I keep hearing that about the technology and I'm like, the technology has been there for years. This is 2020. This isn't 1995. You know, we're just figuring out the internet. We, we have people who do all this, uh, like the shareholder meetings, those things are important. Those are voting things that are going on when, when we're at convention and I don't know if people may just not realize this, but we're at a convention and business is taking place in the room. The chairs up on the, the podium and, uh, they're taking people at the mics, right? People want to be read, recognized at the mic and they get recognized and then they say there's peace and, and things go back and forth. Well, just pretend those mic cords are not 150 feet away, that they're 150 miles away or a thousand miles away. It's still the same cord. We turn on the mic. We give them people the right to say what they want to say. Then we go to the next person and we say, they say what they want to say. We still do the same thing. You still accomplish the same goals. This is being done all the time by larger corporations, the the Constitution Party, the Green Party, the Democrats, and the Republicans have all planning on doing or have held online conventions already. Right? So a party of in IT nerds can't figure this out. Yeah. I mean we're supposed to be the people trying to push blockchain and and all this technology that's gonna free everybody. Why aren't we using it? We should be leading in this, and we're behind. Well, it's I think so we frustrating. Got, so uh, <laughs> there's just no. I mean, you know, they didn't have an argument to us on Twitter, yeah. and so you know, and I, I tried to give them a chance to explain it, and I asked in a fair and respectful way, and they were re they respectfully replied, and we had a good dialogue about it. I, I will say that you know, I hope that this holds. This has been the most respectful. We beat up on libertarians a lot here. 
But this has been the most respectful presidential primary and campaign and, and convention discussion that I've seen so far. And this LNC has been actually pretty good, which we talk about with uh, Joe Bishop Hinchman tomorrow um, about how this LNC operates. Um, it is a far cry from the Bob Barr years. You know, and I think it's because Amash isn't Bob Barr and doesn't have Defensive Marriage Act in his background and voting for wars and all that kind of stuff. You know, I think by and large, there there seems to be a more respectful tone so far. And and the people that are bad actors are just kind of like tuned out a little bit. I, I mean, I don't know what you're seeing. You follow way closer. Like you're always popping in the chat. There's, I can't believe this person said that. I'm like, who the fuck is that? How do you have time to pay attention to these people? Yeah, there's there's a group of people who are who are just horrible bad actors. There was a uh, uh, somebody trying to invent a conspiracy against Joe Bishop Henchman uh, a couple of days ago, and it was just like he found out about it and outed it completely, and just said this is this is horribly and, and wrong. And um, so those people are out there, but I think people are starting to kind of understand that you know it's it's not the same thing as the bar thing it's not those arguments aren't going to work when you have the heir apparent of Ron Paul who was who was knighted by Ron Paul as it were coming and the only the only thing that you're going to get from people right now i think is a lot of people are going to start saying uh he supported uh the um impeachment against Trump and it's like well then you can identify those people who think that you know Trump shouldn't have been impeached and that was one that thing that and, Peter Quinona yeah. said to me yeah. Uh, on Facebook at one point that that like has upset him that he was supporting impeachment and I'm like I think it's perfectly reasonable like you and I disagreed on impeachment we had an entire argument about it and I thought that it was bad politically and I thought that it was a waste of time and you know but I concede the point which is I've seen a lot of people say well Amash fell for the Russian hoax and supported impeachment and I'm just like Okay, you don't even know what the fuck you're talking about because Ukraine and Russia are two different countries and it's two different things. It is perfectly acceptable for the Congress to say, we duly allocated this money and your job as executive is to disperse this without delay. You delayed it for political reasons, personal reasons, and it was an abuse of your presidential authority as executive to execute the orders of the Congress. And we, the Congress, are going to hold you accountable for that. A constitutional libertarian like a Justin Amash, that makes total sense that he would support that argument. It is not far fetched. But if you want to, if you, it, it goes back to the anchor bias. These guys were supporting, they, they, they all have to be contrarian. And I have to ask, how many times do you have to just ask the questions before you finally get to a fucking point? You know, they all just have to be contrarian and I'm going to be cool and not believe the narrative and I'm just going to ask questions and I'm never going to really say anything and then I'm going to see which way the wind blows and then once I figure out what is the truth, uh, I'm going to then start to slowly shift toward, like, we get what you're doing. Like, there, there's so many libertarian, you know, meme pages and podcasters and you're just like, get to the point. We know what you do. At least Jeffrey Tucker has the audacity to be crazy to our face. We now know like that guy is just kind of losing it. Like he's he's buying into the bullshit. And so for whatever reason, I don't know. But like I thought AIER was a really respectful organization until all this happened. And now they're like the Mises Institute to me, you know, not not as credible. And uh, OK, you know, Fee started posting some nonsense that I was just like, please don't fee, please, please. Uh, <laughs> and so. Uh, my point was, uh, what? <laughs> um, uh, We're getting long. What was that? Yeah, I just I'm getting tired now, so I'm getting ranty. But no, I, I'll I'll wrap it up here. Give the final thoughts. Yeah, and, and quit. Oh, my point was that these guys all supported Hornberger. They put a lot behind him, and now they got to see it through to the end, and that's fine. You know, but you don't have to like sit there and lie and make things up. Like, cause you just don't. There's, there's plenty of things to hit a mosh on if you want to hit a mosh on them. Just yeah. quit making stuff up about them. Yeah. All right. Final final thoughts. I know you got more to say. Uh, no, just uh, like I said, if if what's going on in the Libertarian Party is concerning you because of the fact that we may have 
an online convention or a not a convention or voting for the for the president vice president online as opposed to voting in person and timing of when it's going to get done and the possibility of certain states bucking uh, and not putting the the candidate that's selected on their ballots um, talk to your representatives get out there and find out what's going on and make your voice known uh, I think the more people who speak up and tell people what they're feeling and what they are imagining this should be the case um, helps make a better informed decision by the LNC. All right, cool. All right. With that, we say thank you for listening and we appreciate you, uh, your time. And uh, we want to thank our patrons, a special hundred dollar a month patrons, Reinhold being one of them, Anthony Meyer, Craig DaCosta, Ed Brehop, Jason Doolittle, Jeff Bennett, Christy Avery, and Matthew Durbin. Thank you for listening and we will see you tomorrow.